I will talk about two recent developments in international law. Uh, the first is a general comment by the UN Human Rights Committee adopted in October 2018. The second is the Nuclear Ban Treaty adopted in July 2017. Uh, both are terrific resources for advocacy, for making the case for the wrongness, the illegitimacy, the illegality of reliance on nuclear arms. <clears throat> so the UN Human Rights Committee is a body established by the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, the Covenant is a major treaty uh, with all of the nuclear powers except China as states' parties. And China has signed, though it has not ratified. Uh, in paragraph 66, the October 2018 general comment uh, finds that in part, uh, it says in part, the threat or use of weapons of mass destruction in particular nuclear weapons, which are indiscriminate in effect and are of a nature to cause destruction of human life on a catastrophic scale, is incompatible with respect for the right to life and may amount to a crime under international law. Uh, and then it goes on later to say states parties must respect their international obligations to pursue in good faith negotiations in order to achieve the aim of nuclear disarmament under strict and effective international control. Now, uh, at uh, lcmp.org, maybe on Zoom, uh, but probably better at lcmp.org, you will find a full explanation of the comment by Professor Roger Clark and also some stimulating remarks by Peter Weiss. Concerning the illegality of threat, Peter observes that menacing, menacing is a crime under the law of New York State and other jurisdictions. It involves inducing reasonable fear of physical injury by displaying a deadly weapon. Is that not a perfect characterization of so-called deterrence? So I urge you to include this intervention by the UN Human Rights Committee in your advocacy. I think that incompatibility of reliance on nuclear arms with the right to life is a simple, straightforward message that can resonate with the public. This approach avoids getting into all the complexities of the international law of armed conflict, sometimes called international humanitarian law. And the condemnation in the comment is another condemnation of reliance on nuclear weapons by an authoritative international body joining the International Court of Justice Advisor Opinion of 1996. Uh, the second development I want to mention you are already familiar with, the adoption of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Uh, but I want to underline in particular that the preamble to the treaty is a marvelous statement of the political, moral, and legal norms making reliance on nuclear arms unacceptable. Uh, and this, this is true regardless of when the treaty enters into force, how many states parties it has, whether nuclear armed or nuclear threshold or nuclear alliance countries join. So far as the states negotiating the treaty are concerned, and certainly as far as I'm concerned, other international lawyers, these are norms that apply to all states, whether or not they join the treaty, and become subject to all aspects of the operative provisions. I do not have time to go over all the elements of the treaty. Uh, and, oh, so Alan has gotten that up. Very good, Alan. Uh, but <clears throat> let me mention a few things. In terms of normative development, arguably the most significant element was the inclusion of an operative provision prohibiting the threat to use nuclear weapons. This was resisted and only made it into the text late in the negotiations. Uh, despite the fact that a large majority of the negotiating countries supported its inclusion from the beginning, one source of resistance is that threat is not prohibited in existing conventions prohibiting and eliminating biological weapons, chemical weapons, landmines, and cluster munitions. The reply of advocates uh, for including threat, including myself, was that threat and deterrence were not central to states' reliance on those weapons. Uh, 
So together with preambular elements, the inclusion of the threat prohibition will contribute to the delegitimization of deterrence. Uh, the use of nuclear weapons, of course, is also prohibited by an operative provision in the TPNW. But the preamble has a number of elements going to the fundamental point that use of nuclear weapons is contrary to law, whether or not a state joins the treaty. Uh, the preamble reaffirms the need for all states at all times to comply with international humanitarian law and international human rights law, thus joining up with uh, the comment by the UN Human Rights Committee. Uh, the preamble identifies key principles of IHL, including the prohibition of indiscriminate attack. The, pro the preamble considers that any use of nuclear weapons would be contrary to the rules of international law applicable in armed conflict. And the preamble reaffirms that any use of nuclear weapons would be abhorrent to the principles of humanity and the dictates of public conscience. Those are factors with a long history in international law and they have legal as well as moral value. Uh, the preamble additionally reflects general themes that more and more are coming to the fore. It twice refers to the interests of future generations in the non-use of nuclear arms. And it recognizes that the equal, full, and effective participation of both women and men is an essential factor for the promotion and attainment of sustainable peace and security. So I say one more time, in your advocacy, make good use of the Human Rights Committee's general comment on the nuclear ban treaty. They are essential resources for changing the paradigm toward disarmament and away from deterrence. Thank you.